Okay, good uh, afternoon, I suppose. Let's dim the lights. So, welcome to lecture seven, which is going to be about procedural abstraction and higher order programming, right? We want to understand uh, these topics. This is the first time we actually talk explicitly about procedures, though we have seen procedures before, right? So, what are procedures? All languages have them, right? So, they're an important component. Uh, they're essentially means of factorizing and reusing code. Uh, what do we, do we mean by factorizing? Well, what used to happen before having procedures in a language? How did people program? Uh, there will be no procedures, right? So, very, very large pieces of code. Whenever you have to do something, whenever they had to do something again, right, which happens often in, in a program, they would copy the code, right? They would have the same code twice. And then if they would discover that a mistake was in that piece of code that was replicated, then they would have to go and correct it in many places, right? And uh, by inventing procedures, one thing that was achieved was that whenever you make a mistake in this factorized code, you only have to correct it once. Another Another aspect was reuse of code. Instead of writing many times, we just write once and reuse, recall uh, uh, that sequence. This reuse actually takes a much higher dimension because then later procedures can be, could be assembled in libraries and the notion of reuse becomes a lot more extended. You can reuse procedures across programs and not just inside programs. They in general resemble the mathematical functional notation, right? So the, when procedures were invented, uh, the way of calling a procedure was uh, with a syntax that was similar to mathematical functions. Procedure name, bracket, list of arguments, closed bracket. There's two parts, as you very well know. Uh, know you, we, we discussed this in the first lecture. There's a definition and there's an invocation. There's a call, right? So there has to be a match between the invocation and the definition. There is a mechanism at the point of invocation. How do we find the function that fits that invocation, right? Where do we look for the definition? And various languages have different various policies. The definition has a list of formal arguments. That's what we call them, right? So we define the procedure with a name and a list of formal arguments. And those arguments can be used as variables in the body of the procedure, okay? At the invocation side, we have actual arguments, right? And the call binds formal arguments to actual arguments, right? The formal arguments that we have seen in the definition take the values of the um, um, actual arguments and then the computation can proceed. The way this binding is performed differs there are several ways of performing this binding, right? And we'll see several next time. We're going to discuss um, um, parameter passing conventions. <clears throat> but um, what we are used to, and what most languages, but we're not. Uh, so, so today we're not going to we're gonna, not, not, not going to tackle this issue. So, for the time being, we can just assume that whatever we use as formal as uh, actual arguments is evaluated before the call. We'll see that this is not always true, right? But this is the policy in C, in Java, in Scheme, right? Uh, Python as well. So when you call f apply to 1 plus 2, 3 plus 4, and 10 plus 20, let's say you have three arguments and the three actual parameters are expressions, well, first we evaluate 1 plus 2, then we evaluate 3 plus 4, then we evaluate 10 plus 20. We obtain three numeric values, and after that, the binding is performed. So we'll see that not, it's not always the case. Uh, and we're actually going to look at Haskell today, for which this doesn't happen. But for the examples that we're considering today about Haskell, it doesn't really matter that this doesn't, it doesn't happen this way. But we're going to talk about lazy programming lazy evaluation in a couple of weeks, and we'll see that this matters a lot. All right, there's a return value, may have, maybe a return value from every procedure, right, which um, 
uh, can be used at the uh, point at the invocation site. But uh, the means of affecting the environment is not just by the return value, right? We can pass in pointers as arguments, and then we can change the locations that are pointed to by those pointers. Also, some languages transfer their parameters by reference. So instead of transferring the expression 1 plus 2, they transfer the address of the result. The result of 1 plus 2 is placed somewhere in memory, dynamically allocated, and the address of that is passed into the procedure. So there are multiple means of changing the environment of the procedure during the procedure. Now, one important aspect that procedures um, achieve, and we're much more interested in this aspect than in the, in the reuse and in the code factorization. Those, those, those are important, right? But for us, as, as, as far as programming language concept, right? The more important concept brought in by procedures is that of abstraction. Abstraction as a concept means hiding unnecessary details. This is what we do by abstraction. The world is very complex around us. It's very difficult to consider all the details of the world at one time. So what we do is simplify. We simplify the world, we throw away details, we, we try to capture the essential aspects of the world that we want to model, and we obtain an abstraction of the world. All right? We have the ability of hiding details. Um, and uh, how do procedures do that? Well, the proced procedures do that by hiding implementation details. And that's a very good thing. You may think, how can you know hiding stuff from me be good? I want to know everything, right? Well, if you are fed everything, your head will explode, your brain will explode, right? So it's a good thing. You want to not know more than you need to know to achieve a certain task. Um, abstraction is, is everywhere in our lives. Think of driving a car, for instance. You don't need to understand how the engine works in order to drive a car. You are taught, I'm not sure how many of you are driving or, you know, well, I'm, I'm not sure what better example I can, I can choose, but when you drive, you need to know about two pedals or three pedals if you drive a manual, a steering wheel, and there are several less essential controls such as signals, uh, uh, lights, and so on, right? But Essentially, you need to know about the acceleration, the brake, the steering wheel. Uh, that's about it, right? You don't need to know, you don't need to ever open the trunk or the, the, uh, the hood of a car to learn how to drive it. Imagine what if cars were built in such a way that you would actually need to know. I imagine that, that nobody had invented this way of driving a car where the engine can be hidden under a hood and you never know or need to know about it. How, pe how many people would be drivers? <laughs> I have no, no idea, but what I can tell you is that, that um, uh, much fewer people would be, would be, uh, would be drivers, right? Um, um, I, I mean, in Singapore, even putting, driving a manual seems to be a problem, right? So, like, 80% of the population can't drive a manual. Um, so, so, uh, so imagine that, right? So how does it does translate into computer science? Uh, well, think of, you know, you, many of you have gone through the operating systems uh, um, uh, module, right? When you learn how to program on an operating systems system, what do you learn? You learn the API, right? You learn what procedure opens a file for you, what procedure writes into a file for you, what procedure reads from a file, what procedure closes a file, you don't learn how those procedures are implemented. Very important. If you had to learn how those procedures are implemented, it would take tens of years. It would take 10 years for you to become a systems programmer. Right? So the intelligent thing those operating systems programmers or, or designers have done is to create an API that is easy to learn and hide the details so that you can learn fast and become a systems programming without actually knowing how the kernel is implemented. Right? It's about the same principle. You can drive a car without knowing 
how the engine works. And that uh, uh, is, is carried through with every API, right? Java API, if you want to use, I don't know, Swing, or you don't need to learn how to render uh, a um, complicated graph, how to fill a region. You just call a function that fills the region for you, and that's it, right? The API is there, very easy to learn how to use. You don't even need to understand the algorithm. So this creates what we call an abstraction barrier. And it's by means of having procedures, right? Defining an interface to a system. It creates, it's not a real barrier if you really want to go and know and, and find out about how a library is implemented, you can go, right? But in general, the API, the interface to a library is created in such a way that you don't need to know in order to use that library. And uh, uh, in general, when we, we, when we design software, it's very good to create multiple abstractions, abstraction barriers at uh, multiple levels, right, to um, uh, allow modularity, a certain level of modularity, right? So that's one aspect, hides the details away. But the other important aspect from uh, the perspective of software development is that if the details are hidden, the implementer is allowed to change the implementation without letting anybody else know. Has the freedom of changing that. As long as the, the behavior, as you see it from outside, is the same, it doesn't matter what changes um, the implementer makes inside, right? You're still used to, you're still getting what you're used to, right? So you don't really care. And that's very often the case. Most libraries will come with their first version with less efficient algorithms, right? Just to establish a fun functionality. And as time passes and the software gets more refined, subsequent, um, subsequent um, uh, versions will come up with um, uh, better algorithms, right? For the same uh, procedures, for the, for, the same, for the same operations, and you would not notice the difference. You would notice that your software now compiled against the new version of the library just works faster, but works in the same way. You didn't have to make any changes to your own part of the software, which links against the library. Okay? So uh, uh, one very typical example here is set implementation, right? We have a set, a, a set of operations, union intersection difference, etc. And uh, you, could, you could implement a set as a linked list. It's the most straightforward. Um, implementation, right? So, of course, you have to check for consistency. Every time a list is seen as a set, it has to have unique elements and so on, right? But obviously, it's not the most efficient. It's probably the easiest to produce. So when you want to get your software out, you first want to establish some functionality. So what you're going to say is, well, I'm going to release this library with these functions, not necessarily with the best implementation because I just, I'm just racing against the competition and I just want my software to be out there, people to know about it, right? And later, you change from the linked list into a bitmap, for instance, which is much more efficient, has uh, a lot of the operations become constant time, right? More difficult to implement. There's a bit more trouble there. You have to, uh, 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 the software has to be larger, there's more to test and so on, right? But after some effort, you release it. The important thing is now that you still have the union intersection difference, the same operations. It doesn't matter whether the underlying implementation is the linked list or whether it is uh, bitmap, um, right? So if I'm using that library, I bring in the next version, I compile and link against that library, and I see no difference, just that my program is running a bit faster, right? I didn't have to make any changes in my program to um, obtain the new version with the new library. So that's another important aspect, um, right? And, and this will go towards uh, uh, modularity, um, 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 uh, component-based programming, which are important principles of software engineering. And we're going to see a bit more uh, later how a programming language can support these things, right? Um, and can support software development. We discussed in the first lecture that it's not the sole responsibility of programming languages to support large software development, right? But nevertheless, 
right? So it takes a discipline, it takes <laughs> a certain kind of organization, it takes a certain kind of relationship between programming, between programmers, but also it takes certain features to be implemented in the programming language that is used in the implementation, right? And we will have to learn about that part. Okay, so this is abstraction. I hope things are a bit clear. We're going to touch a bit more on this topic later. So, procedural abstractions, I, I've just talked about it, right? Um, but what allows us, so the fact that we take procedures and assemble them into libraries and modules, right? The library is a black box to us. Right, any library we use, actually the language in many cases is a black box to us, right? We're not that worried how it is implemented. If you're a Java programmer, you can see the computer as a Java machine. You can do, you can control the entire computer from Java, right? You can go nowadays and even change registry entries if you want, right? From Java. There are, there's a Java API for um, that. So we treat it as a black box. We learn that for this input, we get that output, that for this kind of, uh, you know, calling patterns, we get this behavior and so on. Um, and we leave it to the implementer to, we leave the freedom to change the implementation as long as the interface stays the same. All right, and in general, they're hard to come up with, right? So, so uh, that's why they change a lot you see from version one to version two. So what we would like is the abstraction barrier to stay the same, but actually it doesn't, right? Over time, um, they try to maintain backward compatibility, but with every new version of a library, there's new elements of the abstraction barrier that were not there before. And sometimes they do break by backward compa compatibility, right? They say this feature that was available in I don't know how many versions ago, not no longer available because there's a conflict or, or something. So in general, they're difficult to design. All right, so let's look at procedures in C, which we know very well, but I'm picking these procedures um, because um, you're familiar with them, right? Because we're going to move into other languages and uh, you need to have terms of comparison. Um, so there's two procedures computing the same thing, and it's the power, right? A to the power of B, all right? And you've seen a similar procedure before. These procedures are recursive, and I'm choosing procedures to be being recursive because we're gonna move into languages that do not support iteration. So the only means of performing repetitive computation is recursion, and we want to have a sort of comparison between languages. So we want to have a objective basis for this comparison. Um, all right, um, and uh, they're a bit different. This one, uh, the first one, right? It, um, it has each of the recursive calls, it has each of the recursive calls somehow in the middle of the computation, right? So notice here that we call P1, Right, we're calling P1 here. And, and after that, there's still some computation to be performed. So upon return from P1, from the, uh, upon return from the recursive call, we still have some computation to perform. The same here, we call P1, and after we return from P1, there's a computation to perform, right? So I would like you to keep that in mind, because we're gonna come back later to that. Whereas in this version, Right, which takes an extra argument, which to make sense, for the computation to make sense, we want this initialized to one, right? So to compute a to the power of b, this third argument, which is an auxiliary argument, should have an initial value of one. But what happens here is that this guy is the recursive call is the last thing the function performs. There's no computation upon return from the recursive call to p2 there's nothing else to perform. So we just jump back and return immediately after that. So this aspect will be important at some point. Please remember it. Okay, uh, how do they work? Um, maybe I should explain that very uh, quickly, right? So if B is 
uh, even, right, we compute P1, A to the power of B divided by 2, and we store that into X, and then the result should be square X, right? So if B is even, A to the power of B is equal to A to the power of B divided by 2 squared. Whereas if B is odd, then A to the power of B is equal to A times A to the power of B minus 1, right? So this is what P1 is essentially saying. Now for P2, for P2, where in fact P2 in fact computes A to the power of B times C, with the underlying assumption that if C, C's initial value is 1, we're going to compute A to the power of B. So then A, so, it, so then A to the power of B times C, right, if B is even, right, is going to be, um, is going to be A square to the power of B times C. And then if B is, so B even, B is odd, we're going to have A to the power of B minus 1 times C times A. Okay? So that's the principle of computing in the second procedure. Okay? And interestingly enough, right, just the addition of this argument allows us to have this property that upon return from P2, nothing else is being called. Okay, Python. So did I show you ever how Python how Python works? You probably have uh, have done it for one of the assignments, right? Um, but it's very easy. I'm not sure which. I think this one is three point three point two one. All right. So short intermezzo on Python. Python works as an evaluator, so it has this kind of behavior. Two plus three will return five. If you want to edit a program, we uh, open, and why would it go to where I left it last time? Lecture seven, and we have a power here, right? So these are the two procedures. Then we press uh, run module. And what this does is load the procedures into the environment, right? So now I can call P, P2, let's, let's say, this is more interesting, of 2, 13, let's say, and 1. And we get a result, right? So it works very much, very interactively. Each expression is immediately evaluated and the result is returned. P2 is seen as a function, okay? And let's look at the elements of... Uh, of uh, Python, so the Python does not have types, right? Types are, it does have types, but they're dynamically inferred, so they don't have to be specified by the user. The keyword for defining a procedure is def. All right, this is the procedure name, two formal arguments, A and B. Remember how Python works. Whenever we want to define a block, we put at the end of the line a uh, colon, and then the entire, all the instructions of the block are indented. The end of the block is where the indentation ends. Right? So all these three parts will be inside the same block. Now, if statements have, oh, as opposed to other languages, right, they have an L if which is, makes it more like a switch case, right? So if B is zero, we can return one. If B is N one, so if, the, if B is, is even, right? We do this, right? We recursively call A with uh, B divided by two and return X times X. Notice the fact that we don't have to declare X. We just use it, okay? And here we return our expression. 
We have to use return statements. Uh, we don't have to put brackets around if and while conditions. Okay? So this is generally the pattern of Python. And uh, knowing this, I think it's, it should be quite easy to transfer. And this is the equivalent P2, right? Which, if you look at the C code, you will find the correspondence very <coughs> easily. Right? Just remember these elements. The fact that this defines a procedure. We have procedure. We have arguments. We need a list of arguments enclosed in brackets. Okay? There's no brackets around. There's no need for brackets. You can put brackets here. There's no, there's no error in that. But they're, they're, they're redundant. And uh, there's no semicolon at the end of the line. Block, blocks are established by indentation. And every instruction that accepts a block needs a semicolon, needs a column. Any questions here? Very easy, right? Good. Scheme. Schemers rejoice, right? The schemer's revenge is coming up. So uh, let me show you a scheme environment. So I'm using, there are many around. And uh, I'm using this one called Racket, which used to be called Dr. Scheme. Now it's called Dr. Racket. If I'm lucky, it will remember my last directory. It's strange. It shouldn't, it doesn't have any reason to take so much time to come up. Um, all right, so let's see how lucky we are here. Yes. So there's a power.scm. Okay, so a window opens. The files are here. We can, we can click on run. And as before, as with Python, when we click run, actually, this text is fed into the interpreter, right? So now I can go here and call my procedures. It's also a language that works as an evaluator, just that the syntax is a bit strange. 2 plus 3 is written like this, bracket plus 2, 3. And we get a result of 5. And if I need to say uh, 2 plus 3 times 4, or let's say, I, yeah, 2 plus 3 times 4, let's say I have to say plus 2, star, 3, 4, with two brackets. So notice that if we write in this way, there's never a problem of precedence and associativity, right? It's, we have to fully specify the order of um, operations for that expression, which is cumbersome. Um, so it's not one of my preferred languages, but it's one that, that, um, that has an important property that we want to talk about. It has meta-circularity. Uh, what's nice about its syntax is that a program has the same structure as a list that it can define inside a program. So you can easily see a program as data, right? It's similar with, to what we have in Prolog, right? We could see a program as data. You can see a program as data, right? So I can say, for instance, define x to be... Uh, and I'm going to put a quote here because this is data. And I can, I can say it's plus 2, 3. And this should be a plus. Right? So now if I evaluate x, x is the program plus. And I can even evaluate it. This is just for... Uh, or to argue, so you, you don't. Do, we, we're not learning. This is not the focus of today's uh, uh, lesson. Just to argue that scheme has an interesting feature that that we'll, we want to talk about later. Uh, all right. So uh, of course, what we want to focus on is the procedure P2, which we can call with two, thirteen, and one, and get a result. And this is how scheme works. Right. Let's let's look a bit at the at the program to understand its structure, and hopefully you have the program in Python or in, in C next to you, so we can compare. So first of all, Scheme does have assignment. So let me tell you up front, it's not one of the preferred features of Scheme. Scheme is trying to be mainly functional. So whenever you learn Scheme, you find out about assignment very late. 
As a functional language, variables have this property of only taking a value once. Once a value has been, once a variable has taken a value, it doesn't change, right? Exactly as in prolog. Though these are not prolog variables. So this is the procedure P1. This is the keyword to define it. You see everything is parenthesized, so it indicates very clearly what the scope of everything is. All right, it's a burden on the programmer. It makes implementation of the interpreter much easier. This is the function name. This is, these are the formal arguments. We're checking whether b is equal to zero. Then we return one. Notice that there's no need for a return statement, right? Whatever we write as a value will be returned. The entire if statement has a value, so everything has a value. So if b is 0, we return 1. Otherwise, if b is even, and this is how we check whether e, b is even, we don't have bitwise operator. I think actually we do have, but I didn't dig enough to do that. See how we invent a new variable. So invent a new variable x with this initial value. The value of x will not change. But what we return here is star xx. Right, the scope of the, the of x, the scope of x is from here up to here. All right, so x is defined. Why do we need two level of brackets? Is because we may write in here. We may add another definition. We may have y to be uh, initialized with three. So this would be a new variable. Right, so we can have a list of variables, and then we can have an expression where these variables. Uh, are uh, used to compute some value. And otherwise, so this is the other branch of if, we compute, right, P1, A times P1 applied to A and B minus 1. So notice B minus 1, notice how we say A times. Okay? P2 is in the same way. And notice again that it's very, it's very clear that P2 <coughs> in both this case in both of these branches is the last thing that is performed in the procedure. Okay. Um, right, so just touching on scheme, I want you also to be comfortable opening up the environment and uh, doing some programming. Um, all right. Um, okay. So uh, we're going to be using OCaml to showcase types alongside with Haskell. It's not a very important program for us. It's a very low level uh, language. It's a functional language as well. It doesn't have assignment. Well, it does, but again, as in Scheme, it's not one of the preferred features. Um, and uh, it's very efficient, all right? It's very efficient. Uh, if you were, are wondering why OCaml can be an important language, look for Jane Street Capital. It's a Wall Street programming firm that uh, writes software for financial transactions. Um, and it's, it's writing it in what? What do you think? In OCaml, right? And they say they, they prefer that because when they hire programmers, the fact that they know OCaml uh, is a guarantee that they're above average. Just by having competence in OCaml will tell them that this is an above average program. Okay? So take from this what you, what you like. Um, so unlike scheme, it's, it's very schemish in nature, but it's typed. Because it's typed, it can, it can be compiled efficiently. It's not interpreted, it's compiled. Uh, and it has uh, uh, efficiency, right? The overhead of the compiled code is on the same level with C. It's almost as fast as C. Um, right, so again, we're defining a symbol. There's no special keyword for defining functions. Uh, we're defining a symbol. That's what this, this let is saying. This is a specifier saying that the symbol is going to be recursive. This is the symbol name, all right? And the only, the only thing that tells us that this is a procedure is the fact that we are providing arguments, A and B. Notice that we don't need brackets. So it has a slightly different syntax for calls. 
instead of A, A, B, as we are used in mathematics, they use F, A, B. We're going to talk a bit more about the syntax. Because when F is applied to A, B, we can think of an invisible operator being placed here. F applied to A, and the result being applied to B. And the effect of that is as if in C we were calling F applied to A, B. But now F, A makes sense as a standalone expression, right? And this is going to come up as important at some point. Um, so for the time being, just remember that this is, this is, for instance, this is our call, right? P1, first argument, second argument. No brackets around the arguments. Same program, right? Uh, we don't have the, uh, the strange uh, prefix notation of, of scheme. We have an if statement, right? This is the test. This is the return value. Everything is an expression. Everything has value, exactly as in scheme. In Python, it's not the case. We, we had to use a return statement, right? Here, we don't. Uh, OK, this one has bit and bitwise operators. So this is the bitwise operator for conjunction, bitwise and. Uh, again, as in scheme, we define a local variable. And when we define it, it's going to take a value and not change that value ever. So this x has the, as a value this, the return value of this expression. And then we're going to return x times x. Otherwise, we have a times and we have a recursive called P1A, B minus 1. Now, notice these brackets. If I say P1A, B minus 1, the compiler will try to do this. Right? So the brackets around B minus 1 are significant. The function application is the tightest binding operator. So the, the function application, which is an invisible operator, right? It's here. I'm putting the, the blue dot to show the invisible operator of application that is in there. And whenever that is seen, it, it, it is the tightest binding. Um, all right. And, and actually, these brackets would not be necessary, but I just wanted to be more sure. Uh, I will never test you on the operator precedence of any language, right? So always on, to be on the safe side, add as many brackets as you want. Um, I, I don't know the precedence by heart, and I often have to go back and uh, check. And it's not the same in every language, as you might expect. So um, since I'm switching so often, uh, often I, I, I happen to be confused. Uh, P2, similar, right? P2, three arguments, right? And two nested, or nested if, again, here you see that there's no, there's no, uh, uh, there's no need for a, an inner definition, and P2 is the last call, right? So here maybe it's more, it's, it's more apparent. So we're calling this, and A times A is going to be evaluated before the call to P2. Then we have this expression will be evaluated before the call to P2, right? So first we compute A times A, then we compute B, uh, oh, shift, shift right. You're wondering what this is. Shift right. Logical. Logical shift right. That's the operator. So we're computing B shift right one. And only after that, we have these two results. We go into the recursion. Right? So P2 is the last thing that happens in that procedure. Haskell. Oh, oh, let me show. What did I do? I did something wrong. OK. So OCaml, this is the interpreter. We can open a file. Luckily, we go back to the. Uh, so this one doesn't have its own editor. All the other ones had an editor. You could open an editor and uh, uh, see the file. Here you can't. You have to use a separate editor and load the, the file. Um, and um, then we can call P2, as we did before, uh, 2 to the power 11 and with an extra argument of 1. And important thing, if we are in the interactive mode, 
if we're not in the interactive mode, we're in a file, we don't need this, right? But if we are in an in a interactive mode, we need a terminator of two semicolons to tell the compiler, stop here, compile what you have, execute. And we get a result. Notice that the result comes with a type, and the type is inferred from the constants, and the type is in fact computed before the execution. It's computed statically. Also, you can see it here. It was compiled, and we see that p1 is a function that takes an integer argument and a second integer argument and returns an integer, right? p2 has three arguments. So first argument, second argument, third argument, and result. And we're going to talk about types in a future lecture. Just keep this in mind. Uh, Right, so I want you to be comfortable in opening all these uh, tools and uh, writing, writing little snippets of a program in there. Okay, so that was OCaml. Haskell, one of my favorites. Um, all right, so Haskell is equ equational. It's an equational language, right? And has many similarity with Prolog, which is a rule-based language. So in principle, for every rule of a Prolog program, you can convert that rule into an, a Haskell equation. So look at how we program here, right? We're saying that P1 for any value A and 0 should return 1. A to the power of 0 is 1, right? A to the power of B, when B... It's, it, keep, it keeps skipping to the next page for some reason. So a to the, to the power of b, when b is even, right? This is the bitwise end, dot ampersand dot in Haskell. And actually, it comes from this library. So you have to, we have to load this library before using that operator. So if b is even, so a to the power of b, when b is even, is... Right, again, we use the keyword let to create a local variable. Haskell does not have assignment. It's not that it has, but it's not preferred. It does not have assignment. So the only way to uh, use repetitive uh, computation, to create repetitive computation, is by uh, the recursion. So the same syntax applies. There is no need for brackets. P1 applied to A and 0, right? This is in the definition. These are the formal arguments. So let x... B, P1 apply to A, and B, shift right to 1. We're going to understand quickly soon what this means, uh, right? But just quickly what, what it means is that if I have a binary function F, and I write FAB, if I don't want to write FAB, I can write F backward code A, backward code F, backward code B, so I can transform any prefix operator into an infix one by use of these backward quotes. And again, in x times x. And the third equation, so notice the following, right? That b is 0 here, b is even here, and there's no guard here, but this is the third equation in the program. So this signifies for all the other values of b. The equations will be used in order. The first that is that matches will apply. There's no backtracking, as Prolog would have. Here, there's no backtracking, right? So the fact that we're not specifying anything here, but we're leaving this as the, the last equation, means that uh, this is for all the values of b, right? Meaning odd b's, right? Uh, we return a times p a1 b minus 1. Right? The same thing happens. If I didn't use these brackets, it will first try to apply P to AB and then subtract 1, which is not what we want. Similar here. Notice I could have used the uh, anonymous variable here. So this could have been the anonymous variable. We see it here, right? Because A is not used, is singleton, right? It's not used on the right-hand side. So no point in naming it. So anything to the power of 0 times C is C. Right? A to the power of B times C, if B is even, is square A to the power of B divided by 2 times C. A to the power of B times C, for all the other Bs, is 
a to the power b minus 1 times c times a. Right? So this is the third function. Again, Haskell does not have uh, its own editor. So what we have to do is, there's this lambda here. So this uh, loads, and we have to load a file, and this is the power. Now, uh, let me show you the power Haskell. When you write a, 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 a Haskell file, there's a little quirk. There's a little, you, we have to start every Haskell file with a module name. And the main module should bear the name main. So most of your program, Haskell programs, will start with module main where. We, of course, import the library that gives us bitwise operations. And then this is the program, right? These are the, the function definitions. So when you load your program, which I have just done, you notice the prompt here changing to main, meaning that your program was loaded. And as before, we're going to say p2, 2 to the power 13, 1, 8192, blah. Okay? Again, this is uh, an evaluator. So if I say 1 plus 2, it will compute 3. And uh, anything has a value. I, I think I've shown you. Uh, so there's, there, there are many goodies. I can say uh, 1 to 10. So like in Python, we get um, the entire list. And there's this comprehensions, which you also see in, in Python. Many features of Python were, in, were inspired from Haskell, as a matter of fact. OK, and just to come back to something that is familiar, this is what procedures are in Prolog. They're just de predicate definitions. So we have the two, uh, uh, the two procedures uh, as predicates in Prolog. Um, and uh, I'm not going to say anything more here because you already know enough to appreciate them on their own, right? Just to provide a full comparison. So these are these were examples of procedures in a variety of languages that we are interested in. We are, are introducing these languages in this way, right? So we're going to do small tweaks and produce similar recursive programs as practice in these languages. You don't need to learn the language fully. Just by looking at the slide and recombining the operators, you should be able to produce the solution, right? In all these languages, you know how to define a procedure. You know how to uh, write an if statement. You know how to perform a recursive call. You know how to define a local variable, right? You know how to add, subtract, perform bitwise operations, right? So if I'm going to uh, tell you, instead of a to the power of b, compute me the factorial, you should, just by looking at that, you should have no problem in using all those elements and producing a factorial function. OK? So just by association, you should be able to get a solution. And that should be enough practice in each of these languages. Now, the important aspect that we have talked about here is recursion. Right? Everything was recursive, and it's because many of these languages do not have assignment or have it as a separate, as a step, separate, as a non-preferred feature. Um, right? And if we don't have assignment, we can't, we can't have while loops. Right? If every variable gets one value, I can't go back to the while condition and expect it to, to, to change. Right? So we can't have while loops. So the only thing is uh, to um, have um, uh, recursion. And that's the only way to, re to implement repetitive computation. We distinguish between tail recursion and non-tail recursion, right? P2, in our previous examples, was tail recursive. P1 was non-tail recursive. Actually, the term non-tail recursion is uh, I just invented it right now because I, I don't have a, 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 a better way to distinguish between them, right? So there's general recursion and there's tail recursion, right? Tail recursion forms a small um, part. It can be optimized to be compiled efficiently. 
And we're going to see why. We're going to try to understand why. Okay? So let's look at how P1 would get executed. And I'm going to show you here on the right the definition of P1 in Haskell. Right? So this is the definition of P1 in Haskell. And this is the execution, P1 to 11. So this guy is odd, right? So I'm going to take this case. So um, is what? So I'm going to take this case, right? And uh, what's going to happen here is that my new expression should be this one, right? So you see, instead of this, I'm going to take the equivalent expression that is given by the underlying part. Is this clear? This should be my next thing to compute. And now, notice the following thing. I cannot compute this multiplication unless I know the return value of P1. So I have to postpone, the, I have to delay the multiplication, compute P1, and then when I come back, I have to go in and uh, perform the multiplication. But this will happen over and over. So we're going to have a lot of delay operations, as you probably can, can already guess. So this star, this multiplication has to be placed somewhere so that it can be remembered. And all of them have to be placed somewhere so that it, they can be remembered. So they will be placed in a stack. But we're going to talk about that later. Notice how the expression keeps growing. So next step is this is even. So the next expression to compute is going to be this one. So I'm going to replace this by this, right? And notice now that I can't perform this multiplication before I know the return value of P1. So I already have two delayed multiplications, right? And the expression has grown a bit. And this guy is odd, right? So this expression that I see, that you see here, I'm going to go to this case and I'm going to use this expression right here. So you see the replacement, right? So my expression has grown a bit more. And again, I can't perform this multiplication before I know the result of P1. So at this point, there are three delayed multiplications. This one is delayed, this one is delayed, and this one is delayed as well, right? And we go further. This is now even. So P124 will have to be replaced by the equivalent expression in here, right? So you see the replacement right here. And again, this has to be delayed, right? And P122, this is even now. So P122 should be, again, replaced by this expression. So you see P122 being replaced here by this. And the expression has grown a bit more. And finally, P121 can be replaced by 2 times 1. And now we can go and perform all the evaluations in reverse order of their delay, of the, of the order in which they were delayed, right? So this is the most recently delayed. We can perform this. Right after this, we can go and perform this. Right after this, we can go and perform this. Right after this, we can perform this one. Then we can perform this one. And finally, we can perform this one, and we get to this result, right? So in this evaluation process, the size of our expression has grown and then has shrunk. And at some point, I must have this amount of memory, which is nonlinear, right, in, in respect, with respect to the input, to store the expression. Now we're going to say, ah, what, how much memory is there? A few bytes, right? But in general, it's not constant. And we, I can come up with cases when it grows really, really large. And then not all programs will have this kind of input. Some pro problems will have inputs in, in the millions or in the billions even, right? So the, the important aspect to understand here is that the size of the expression grows and then shrinks. And there's these delayed operations that have to be stored somewhere, and that storage has to exist as memory. Okay? Let's go to P2 and go through the same process and see how that one fares. 
Okay. Well, you can guess that now I'm going to make the point that it's a lot more efficient. Okay. So, P2111, right? This is odd. I'm going to take this one. So, this is my new expression. So, you see it here. Now, I have P2210. This is even. I'm going to take this branch. So, this is going to be my new expression. You can see it here. Right? Why? Because there's nothing to, to delay now. First, I have to compute this, and then this, and only then I perform the recursive call. There's nothing to delay. Right? Next thing, this is even, so I'm going to go and compute this. This is, sorry, this is odd, I'm going to compute this. This is even, I'm going to compute this, and so on and so forth. I'm going to get a result. At each step, at each step, the amount of memory, the amount of storage for my current expression is constant. Right? So this is tail recursion. It's the last thing we do in that procedure is the recursive call. Previously, that was not the case. For P1, that was not the case. We would perform the recursive call, and then we would still have a multiplication to perform. Come back from the recursive call, still a multiplication there. Here, I come back from the recursive call, but there's nothing else to do. I further return up the chain of calls. All right? Is this clear? This is a very important thing that we're learning now. So, any questions? Good. So, one thing that we're going to be doing in tutorials and potential exam questions, uh, exam question is take this non-tail recursive version, convert it into tail recursive, right? So, you will have to develop that kind of skill. Okay, let's see how that skill can be developed. So, one thing that I've seen several times in your posts was, I know how to do it in C, how do I do it in Prolog, where there, there's no assignment, right? So let's try to see how can we replace iteration with recursion. And that's going to be a skill that works not just between C and Prolog, between C and any other language that does not have assignment. Okay? So let's take this while loop. Um, all right? And which is computing, so would be computing the same thing, right? So, so I'm writing the while loop of a program that computes the power. I'm just not giving you the power, um, the, 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 the uh, definition of the entire definition, right? Just the while loop that would appear in there. But we still have our ABCs, right? And A, B are the inputs, and C is sort of the output, right? So we're, uh, we're initializing C with 1. A, B would be uh, their whatever initial values that they have. As long as it's 0, we keep in the while loop. If B is odd, we perform these two computations. Otherwise, we perform these two computations, and we keep repeating till B becomes 0, right? B keeps decreasing. How do we convert this into a recursive function? So remember now, the translation scheme requires that every while loop have its own recursive function, helper, right? So if you're trying to convert a C program into a uh, Prolog or, or uh, Scheme or uh, Haskell or OCaml program, for every while you'll need a helper procedure that will be recursive, right? So all the arguments of the procedure, of the all, all the variables, sorry, all the variables in your program, B, A, and C, so you, we go through the entire program, we or the entire while loop, and we see what are the variables being used, they become arguments to the procedure. And I'm doing this first time in C, so what you're going to see is a recursive C procedure. There are some more transformations to make it amenable for OCaml or, or Haskell. All right? So every variable that you see here becomes an argument to the procedure. Right? Then, very simple. I just copy the loop body. I just copy the loop body, right? And at the bottom, I just say return P2ABC. 
right? So conversion from while loop into into recursive procedure. This recursive procedure is necessarily tailed recursive. Okay. Now, still not ready for a camel, right? For conversion into a camel, or I'm, I can't even remember what language I'm going to show, but I'm going to discover when I go to the next slide. Uh, nevertheless, we still have assignment. We don't like assignment. So we want to convert from a version that uses assignment to a version that doesn't use assignment. How can we do that? Or, you know, doesn't use assignment in the sense that we declare variables and we give them a value only once. We're still going to be using C assignment for that. But the fact that we're giving them a value only once that doesn't change subsequently means that we're sort of, it's going to be easier to translate into a language with no assignment. So easy. We declare new variables. And instead of changing the variables, we assign those values to new variables. So this is the new version. What we have done is we have a 1, B1, C1 as local variables. And instead of modifying A, we assign the, what previously used to be the modification of A, we assign to the new variable A1. What used to be the modification of B, we assign to the new variable B1. What used to be the non-modification of C, so C was here, I assign it to C1. So you may say that this is not necessary, but just for making it systematic, we provide it here. And the same goes on here, right? So A1, B1, C1 takes the values of the modifications of the corresponding variables. And then when we perform the recursive call, right, we just use the new variables as arguments. Easy, right? So now we sort of have a single assignment program. Every variable takes a value at most once. But this is still C. But it's much easier to go to, to go to, um, um, a, a language with no assignment. So yet another modification that we want to do, right? What we're going to see is that this is difficult to simulate in a language with no assignment. We can't have a 1B1C1. We would prefer to have a 1B1C1 here. So we would prefer to have two separate local declarations instead of just one at the top. But if we do that, this guy becomes out of scope. So then what am I going to do? If A1, B1, I have two versions of A1, B1, C1, each one inside its local block here, then I'm going to replicate the return. I'm going to put the return here to have the return being in scope of those variables, right? So this is what we obtain. So this is pretty much the same, just that instead of having the declaration here, I have two declarations here. Instead of having one return here, right? So this is not here anymore, and this is not here anymore. We now have two return statements here, which are in scope. And now we're ready to go to a single assignment program. So yeah, so this is OCaml. And it becomes exactly this thing, right? So if you look at, this is this, the, the C version that you have seen on the previous slide. Right? This is exactly the C version that we have seen in the previous slide. So you see this local declaration is converted into a local declaration here. And this return statement is converted into this return statement. Actually, there's no return statement, but this expression is what is returned. And similar here, local declaration, return value. And we have a recursive OCaml program that, that is tail recursive, implements exactly the same computation, right? So there's a pretty straightforward way of going from a while loop into a recursive function that computes the same thing. So now if you know how to do it in C, you should know how to do it in Camel, or Haskell, or Prolog, or Scheme. Okay. Questions here? Okay. So everybody is shaking their head, no question. I'm hoping that it's not because you're totally bored and have lost uh, track of what's happening half an hour ago. OK, all clear? Everybody's happy? Good, wonderful. 
Okay, and we move on into the next part of the lecture, which is procedures as first class values. What do we mean by first class value? We touched on that uh, a, a few lessons ago, right? Uh, something that can become the value of a variable can be used as an argument or a return value, right? And can be created as an unnamed value. Okay. So, for instance, integers are first class values in all languages. You, you can create, uh, I mean, you can assign a, an integer to a variable, you can put it as an argument, you can use it as a return value, and, you know, the number three starts tends for itself. You don't have to call it x, right? But if you think of functions, right, they're, in general, in many languages, they're not first class values. So it's not always easy to return or to, to take a function as an argument, or to give, uh, to assign a function uh, to a variable, right? So essentially, you can say that this int f, blah, 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 right? You define in C a function. This f is what? It is a symbol, right? But as a symbol, what's its type? Is it a variable? What is it? Louder. Oh, of course it has a type. It has the type of function. Is it a variable? Again? Well, yes, but, you know, more, is it like, you know, we have variables, we have constants, we have symbolic constants. Which class of symbols does it fall into? Is it a variable? Is f a variable? Louder. It's a constant, right? It's a symbolic constant. I can't assign to it. I can't say f is assigned to something, right? So it's not a variable. If it were a variable, I could assign to it. Okay? So, so in C, for instance, functions are not first class values. Uh, more importantly, it cannot be created as, as an unnamed value. Right? I can say that f is the function that increases its argument, uh, the value of its argument by 3. But you see, in English, I can create, I can say this phrase, the function that increments its argument by three, that adds three to its argument, or returns three plus, uh, plus its argument. You see, I have described the function. I have not said that this is function f. Right? This is an important feature. I don't have to say that it's f. When I say three, you know what it is. I don't have to say that three is called x. Right? So this is what we mean by this last uh, bullet here, or dash. So uh, many languages allow functions at as first class values, uh, right? Uh, exception is C. In C, we can still get away with pointers to functions. So many things that we want to do with functions at first class values, we can still do with pointers to functions. Um, and the uh, prolog does, we haven't talked about that, right, does allow dynamic modification of programs which can simulate um, functions as first class values, uh, but it's not quite that. So uh, let's try to elucidate this, functions as unnamed entities, right? So I'm going to say, you know, define the function. I want an expression that defines the function that adds one to its argument. And I don't want it to be named. Um, so now you have to uh, uh, agree that there has to be there uh, something there that specify what's the argument and how it is returned. And in this process, this expression should not have a name, should be a constant, right? Well, this is how it is. This constant is written in scheme, right? So lambda x plus x1. This is a function because of this lambda expression, lambda notation. And lambda, if you want to find something equivalent, uh, it's like a quantifier in logic. In logic, you say for all x, blah, 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 or exists x, blah, 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 right? In functional programming, we say lambda x, x plus 1. This is like a quantifier, and it denotes the function that increments its argument by 1 and returns the value, right? This is how we encode it into scheme. Lambda x plus x1, of course, with a strange syntax of scheme, how do we apply this function? Well, you see this expression denotes the function. Apply it to an argument of 5, we'll evaluate to 6. You know, camel. 
we say fun x goes to x plus 1, maps into x plus 1. This fun has the role of lambda. And again, it's like a quantifier. It will say that this x is the argument of an unnamed function. So then I can go and apply this function, which is a constant, but doesn't have a name. I can apply it to 5, get the value 6. This is the Haskell equivalent. Instead of fun or lambda, Haskell uses backslash. Backslash x shows that this is the start of a function whose argument is x. The return value should be x plus 1. So then look at this expression right here. Backslash s, x maps into x plus 1. It's a constant, not named. I can apply it to 5, get back to value 6. And finally, Python has lambda abstraction as well. So lambda x colon x plus 1, right? This lambda says that this is the beginning of a function whose argument is x, and what comes after the, semi, the colon is the return value. So we can say lambda x colon x plus 1. Notice that Python still wants the brackets. Okay? So, and, and we can have multiple arguments. We can say lambda x comma y and computer expression in terms of uh, x, y. And here we can have 5 comma other argument and have multiple arguments in this one. Is this clear? We're going to play. Yes? Um, what if No, no, it has to be a function. So you compute an expression. You should not have a while in trying. You, you can call. Um, these should be one-liners. I'm not sure Python is that, is that evolved, evolved as to allow you to write a full program inside. Um, but um, I, I think. Well, actually, we can try, right? Do I still have the Python interpreter? Um, so if I want to say lambda x, uh, let's say that I want to say y equals x semicolon uh, y times y applied to 3. Yeah, so this one doesn't work. I, I don't remember seeing. I, 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 I can check uh, whether there's anything. Does it work with braces? No. I, I'll, I'll check. So there has to be something. You can't be completely uh, unable. I mean, it, it, there has to be some ability to, to define local variables. But um, from what I remember, you can't have statements uh, as complex as while or, you know, for that you can you have to use named functions. So I can I can have a function call inside here. I can say return p time p p time p of x times p of x, where p is a p is a named function. But I can't have, inside an unnamed function. I can't have uh, statements. Okay. But I'll um, I'll uh, if you if you can remind me in, in the forum, just pose the question, and then that that remind me, and I'll I'll look and and uh, find an answer. Okay. So all this is for uh, defining for for learning how to work with. Uh, functions as, as first class value, values. This is a style of programming called higher order programming. All right, and we're going to showcase it in um, uh, using the half interval method. Right, so we were trying to solve f x equals zero this equation. Right, and how do we do it? Uh, it uh, half interval method. How many people have heard of it? One, two. Oh, can be that few. Half interval method, right? So what you do is you have a function, right? I'm, I'm just drawing the OX axis. It has a root here, right? 
the uh, the function is not algebraic, so you can't you can't you can't solve it exactly. So you want to find an approximation. You start with an interval where you expect the solution to be. Obviously, because we expect you expect the solution there. If your function is here, f of x1 and f of x2. Right, this is x1 and x2 actually, x1, x2. F1 f, fx1 times fx2 should be negative, right? One should be negative, the other should be positive. And then what we're going to do is find the middle of the interval, check the value fx middle, if it's and, and find the pair such as fx middle and fx, x, FX, FX extremity. The, the product is negative, and it means that the root is inside that new interval, right? So we have halved the interval where the root might reside. And we keep halving and halving and halving till the length of the interval is smaller than an epsilon, okay? So, so this is just a method to solve. Uh, it's, it's not really important. It's, it's uh, reasonably simple. The interesting aspect for us is that I'm going to take the function as a argument. I'm going to write a program where I don't know what the function is going to be in advance. Right, my function is going to be an argument. So, f is an argument, right? These are the approximations, the current approximation, x1, x2, and this is the precision. So, as soon as the, the, the length of my interval is less than the precision, I can return this as a result. Right? I don't even need to look at it. Now, otherwise, so remember, these are guards. This is Haskell, right? These are guards. So, first we're trying this. If this doesn't hold, I'm going to move up on to the next equation. So in the next equation, I'm checking whether fx1 times f x1 plus x2 divided by 2 is less than 0. If this is true, it means that the root that I'm looking for is between x1 and x1 plus x2 divided by 2. Right? So I have an interval. I, I take the middle. And if my function, if my root is here, it means that these two values, when I multiply them, they should be negative. One should be negative, the other should be positive. So if that happens, I have to continue searching, but my new extremities of my current interval are going to be these. I recompute them. Otherwise, if fx2 times, so you see here I had fx1, if fx2 times f middle is less than 0, then my new extremities are going to be these. And notice that the program is sort of incomplete and we don't really care that it is, right? We're not providing anything for the other cases. There are several other cases there that we should be taking into consideration. Okay? And Haskell is fine with that. So, we take this, and this f is unknown immediately, right? You, you can see that f is a variable, and I can apply it to any value I want. f is not known in advance. Now, how am I going to create a function for it? Well, I'm going to take solve. I'm going to create a, a, a constant function on the fly here without giving it a name, I'm going to get some extremities and some precision, right? This function is x squared minus 1, and it has a root at x equals 1, right? x squared minus 1 equals 0. x equals 1 is one of the roots, right? So this will be found when we call it. And the important aspect is that we're creating a function on the fly. And uh, we can use predefined functions as well. I can solve it with cos, cosine, between 1 and 4, right? It has cosine of x equals 0 has a root at uh, x equals pi divided by 2, right? So you see pi divided by 2 here. And sine has a root at x equals pi. So you can see pi here, right? But the important thing is, look at my argument here. So I have cos, I have sine. I have any other function, backslash x something, I can produce a function on the fly, and I can, uh, I, I have devised this method, right, that takes in a function whose expression I don't know in advance, and I can write a program about that. So solve is a higher order function. Solve is a higher order function, right, higher order, because its first argument is another function. Right? Is this clear?
Yes? Everybody happy? All right. So we can do the same thing in Python. All right. So very similar. The first argument is f, just that the syntax is a bit different. We have to cater to the syntax of Python. I can write f apply to x1, and f apply to some other expression, right? We need the brackets. And then we need to return statements, which Haskell doesn't need. If I just write, if I just write this expression without, if I forget about the return, let's say, I'm still going to get a working procedure that doesn't return anything. So Python will not return anything unless it is explicitly written. And then we can have the, the, same, the same computations, right? This will be x squared minus 1, okay? And guess what? We can't write sine in Python. I can't come in here and write sine, because sine is an object. It's not really a function. So I can write sine dot something, I can, I can, but I can't write. I can't write. So we have to wrap the sine function inside the lambda expression. That will be the case with scheme as well. No, actually that will not be the case with scheme. Sorry. That will, that, the scheme would work like, like, like Haskell. Uh, all right, so we have to do this. Sine will not work by itself. And the same here. And we have the same computation. Still, it's a very convenient way, right? We can write very generic procedures. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I remember. I wasn't very sure, but that's that's what I remember as well. You, you definitely can't have statements, but uh, I, I'm I'm pretty sure you must be able somehow. You must have the equivalent of a left. Not not the. You must be able to declare a a variable inside. I think. Um. Something like let something in. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll check and, and uh, uh, come up. But no no while definitely no statements no assignment no while. Uh, this is the scheme equivalent, right? And in scheme we're introducing a uh, um, you know a, a more complex uh, uh, instead of having two ifs we we can have this statement called cond, which is like a switch else. Uh, switch switch uh, case, right? But um, don't don't uh, draw too much of a parallel with C because these clauses will be tried sequentially. There's no there's no constant time jump to the correct branch. So it'll try this one first, and if it doesn't work, we'll move on to the next one. We'll try all of them sequentially. Uh, so the same principle. Notice how F is applied. This is the application of f to its argument. So f is a variable that is expected to be a function, right? And we apply f to its argument. And in scheme, the expression is f, right, x1, sorry, x2, x3, with spaces in between. And if we write like this, there's no f x1 being a valid expression as it is in Haskell, right? So Haskell is special. Scheme will have a fixed number of arguments per procedure. Now, notice the expression here. This is x squared minus 1. But sine and cos will work out of the box. So we have the same result. OK? Now, this leads to a very interesting style of programming. We can define a set of primitives and then live inside uh, uh, higher programming for all, our, all the processing that, that is on collections. Right? And by collections, in, I, I mean especially lists. So we're going to have to see lists and, and these languages in a minute. But we're going to have these four primitives, map, fold, filter, zip. And once we learn about them, I'm going to say, forget about recursion. Everything you program should be in terms of these primitives. Recursion doesn't exist anymore. So map applies a function to every element of a collection and creates a similar collection of results. Each of these functions is going to be defined. So we're going to see how it works. 
the important thing is that they form a very useful abstraction barrier. It's an abstraction barrier. We can live at this level without knowing anything underneath, we know, without knowing recursion. Okay, so we're going to try to live there and see how it is. And you're going to decide whether you like it or not, right? But you have at least, you at least need to know how it is there to have a, 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 a um, educated opinion about it. So, now these languages that use recursion, um, they prefer recursive data types. Arrays are not recursive data types, right? But lists are. List is either nil or a constructor of an element and another list. Right? So it's recursive in nature. Um, so lists are more suitable to a recursive programming than arrays. And um, they're preferred in Haskell and OCaml and, and Scheme as well. They're preferred. So we're going to look at the syntax of um, list in Haskell and OCaml. Um, and and uh, we're going to look at the syntax of list and uh, scheme in, in the tutorial. Um, so uh, very, very similar to Prolog, right? So Haskell, this is the empty list. H colon T. It used to be H bar T, right? H colon T is the list with head H and tail T. Notice that in Haskell, variables have to be small case. Prolog variables had to be capitals, right? Capitalized. Small case. Capitals in Haskell means modules or data constructors. Um, yeah, so this is one of the rules that we're going to learn on the fly. So a list with head H and tail T. Um, this would be a list containing the elements 1, 2, 3, right? So exactly as in Prolog. Uh, bracket one, two, three, separated by commas. Well, camel, on the other hand, uh, this is the empty list as before, but the the list with head H and tail T, right? The constructor for the list is double colon, not colon, but double colon. And then, when we want to create a list containing elements one, two, three, we have to separate the elements by semicolon and not comma. Okay, so you can very easily see how you can get confused if you if you switch between these languages. Um, okay, so let's learn about map. All these functions work on; they can potentially be defined on a collection, but they work on lists. So first, let's see what we want to achieve. Right? Notice this is a squaring function. X goes to the square of X. We apply it to the 1, 2, 3, 4, and we get the list of squares of those elements. This is what, what map does. Take this function, applies it individually to each element, produces a list of results. How do we do that? Well, to map f on the empty list, we should get back the empty list. And if I map f on the list x followed by xs, right? So x is the head, xs is the tail. The result should be fx followed by map recursively applied to f and xs, right? So very easy to define. Now, OCaml is not equational. When we have a list L, right? So this is on two lines because I, I, I don't have the space, but so the match should be at least a bit indented. So let rec map, let rec, let rec, let says if we define a symbol, rec means that it's recursive. This is the symbol name, it has two arguments, f and l. So when we uh, analyze a, a recursive data type, right, we match it. We perform pattern matching. So we match L, and L can be either the empty list or the list containing a head and a tail, right? So this is what this statement says. Match L with what are the possibilities, either the empty list or the list containing a head and a tail. If L is the empty list, then return the empty list. Otherwise, if L is the list containing X and XS, then construct the list made up of FX. And, and uh, uh, actually, FX here is, is F, the brackets are not necessary. Uh, map F XS recursively, right? And remember, if we are in the uh, interactive environment, to have this definition processed, we need to type a double semicolon. And this is how it would be used. We map, we construct the function on the fly. This is the list containing one, two, three, four, and we get 
a list of results. All right, fold left. Fold left, so we're going to see immediately the difference between left and right. Um, so I take this list, I take an operator, and I put that operator in between all the elements of a list. Right? And I also provide a result for the case when the list is empty. So essentially, what I'm going to do here, fold L, right, is going to uh, perform the computation 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. Right? And actually, 0 is going to come right here. The question is, how do we, asso do we associate to the left or to the right? Because plus happens to be associative, but not all of them, right? So fold left associates to the left. It actually computes this. And you can see it using integer division here, because integer division is non-associative. So if you put the brackets differently here, you will get a different result, right? So if we do fold L div 3 to 3 to 100, 3,768, 16804, uh, right? We get the result of 64, which is the result of this expression, right? Which shows the fact that the association of the operator, whatever operator I put here, whatever operator I put here, right? The function will build the expression in such a way that the operator is associated to the left. This is the similar fold left uh, um, expression uh, function in in uh, in um, uh, Haskell, and by the way, these are predefined. You don't have to go and write them again. They're part of the library. Okay, and the same thing. This is the integer division in um, or camel. Fold right, on the other hand, associates to the right. And again, we have an expression here, which would be different. Of, of course, we're, we're, we're doing the fold right, fold right on uh, with plus on a list and integer, we're going to get exactly the same result as on the previous slide because plus is associative, so it doesn't make a difference. But if we're using it on a non-associative operator, we would get this expression, which produces this result, 8. And this expression, if you put it in fold uh, left, you would get a different result, right? Obviously, if you associate like this, you would get a different computation and a different result. So we have map, fold left, fold right, and there's a, oh, filter. I forgot to mention filter, I think. And uh, filter does what? Filter removes from the list elements that don't satisfy a predicate. So filter, we take a predicate. So it has to be something that returns a Boolean. So you notice that this operator returns a Boolean. And this function selects or, or filters the even numbers. So when we apply it to a list, we're going to get out, out of that only the even members of the list in the same order. Right, similar, similar function in our camel. Okay, and finally we have zip with. So zip with will take two lists and will combine elements of the same rank via the operator provided here. Okay, now one thing that I swept under the carpet, I think, is the fact that the plus is in brackets. Okay? We call it a cut. And uh, by putting it in brackets, we get the addition function. The addition function is one that takes two arguments and um, produces a result. Um, so let me clarify that before I write. So if I say plus two, three, get five. But if I say plus with no brackets, two, three, I get an error, right? Because plus without brackets is a binary operator, so I have to write two plus three, whereas if I write plus inside brackets, I get a function, right? And that function can be applied to two arguments. Now, uh, right, so, so I can even write this, uh, plus and then later 3, and I get 5, and you're going to wonder now, what is plus 2? What is plus 2? Uh, 
Um, it's the function that adds two to its argument, right? So I can write the following thing. Let f equals uh, plus f plus 2 in f applied to 3. What do you think I want to get now? 5, right? But notice what f is. f is the function that has one argument and adds two to that argument, right? So, so um, it, it's 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 just a convenient way to express to to build new functions out of existing functions. Okay, so that's why we put plus there. Plus is the addition function as opposed to the addition operator. And uh, what it does, right? If we have two two lists of the same length, it will take pairs of elements and combine them via the operator and put the result in a result list. Okay. So it would get 1 plus 10, 11, 2 plus 20, 22, and so on. Okay, so we have these primitives. And now I'm telling you there's no more recursion. And you have to just use these primitives to write your programs. Uh, so I, uh, in, in, order, in, in writing these programs, we have to compute to create functions on the fly. That's a very important thing. And we have to manipulate lists. So let's go in Haskell and, and learn a bit about that. So this is something I already told you about, right? We write fx instead of f applied to x. And f, a, b, c, right? Let's say we have a function with three arguments. Actually, there's an invisible application operator in between these elements, right? So the equivalent expression is f applied to b. The result of that applied to c so, sorry, f applied to a, the result applied, uh, that applied to b, and the result of that applied to c, right? f a will be then what? A function that expects two arguments. f is a function that expects three arguments. f a is a function that expects two arguments, right? I can say g equals f a, and g b c is going to be the same as f a b c. Okay? Now, we can write cuts. So, plus is in fact a cut. But I can write 3 plus, and I can get this function. So 3 plus is a simple way, a simple replacement for this, right? Um, operators can be declared infix or infix r. This is something that we're actually not going to really touch, just, just for information. So um, in Prolo, we could define operations. In Haskell, we can define operators as well. As infix or infix are, prefix operators are any function is prefix, and there's no postfix operator. And uh, any function of this form, div xy, if we like to write it infix, we can just surround div with back quotes, not forward quotes, back quotes, right? And put it in the middle. And if that makes our programs more readable, it can be done. Uh, there's function composition. So again, we're going to have to produce functions on the fly, function composition, right? So notice this expression. So I have a function. I have another function. The result of that expression is the composition, which is further applied to 3 and produces the value, value uh, 10, right? So what we're doing is we're squaring 3 and then we're adding 1. What's this? It's the equivalent of this expression. First, I square 3, and then I apply 1. But guess what? I can actually write f equals backslash x, x plus 1, dot backslash x, x plus x star x. So this is my f, and I can go later and apply f to 3. Don't have to do it immediately, right? So I have computed, I have created a function on the fly. Um, we will need a list append as we did in Prolog, so plus plus is list append. There's a length operator, and we have list comprehensions, uh, which we, we've seen quite a bit, and they're available in Python, and they work pretty much in the same way, right? So this, for instance, a function that, um, a, a list of elements x, where x is a member of this list, and also this predicate, this, this condition holds for every element, right? So we filter out only odd elements whose, uh, for which uh, uh, the expression x times x minus 1 is greater than 10. Um, we have the functions head and tail. Head will 
it select the head of the, the list, tail will t select the, the tail of the list, we have a, um, a rank operator, right? So we, we can get ele the element of rank k. This is the double, um, uh, the double exclamation mark. Um, the list starts at zero. The first rank is zero. Uh, okay? We can take a prefix of a list and we can drop a prefix of a list. And all these will be useful uh, functions. It's just for reference, bring it to the um, bring it to the tutorial so you can be inspired when you solve your tutorial questions. And let's look at a real example. And we're going to see many of these. We want to transpose a matrix. And we see a matrix. We see a matrix as a list of lists. Right? So each element of the top list is a row in the matrix. Right? Is another list that represents a row in the matrix. So first row, second row, third row. And we want to transpose. The transposition would be, right, what? Well, the first element of each of the sublists go into this sublist. The second elements of each of the input sublists go into the second sublist here. The third elements go into the third sublist, right? So this is the transposition. This is the expression. If it does that, no recursion. Okay? <coughs> what I do here is there's L, right? And uh, I'm going to select for every, uh, from this L, I'm going to uh, um, um, select the element, for each of these elements, I'm going to select the element of rank I. And this I will go from 0 to length of L minus 1, right? So two maps nested will do the trick. There's no need for recursion. Okay? Uh, there's many things. We're going to see permutations, for instance, being done in this way. We're going to see prime numbers being done in this way. And later, we're going to see something even more interesting in, in Haskell. This list actually can be infinite because of laziness. And when we combine higher programming with laziness, we get really mind-boggling stuff. We get ex extremely simple expressions for, extremely com uh, for, for computations that in other languages would, would be extremely uh, uh, extremely complicated. Okay, so we're going to see examples of that, but that's yet to come. So, this is it for today. Thanks for your attention. See you next time. See you tomorrow, as a matter of fact. <laughs>